I want to start out by thanking everyone for coming. Um, we are, this fall is, uh, we are celebrating our 40th anniversary here in Northampton. Um, and uh, we're going to be doing some special shows. And our first very special show is the show you are seeing right now, a retrospective of Leonard Baskin's sculpture. Um, Baskin is certainly the day I met Mr. Baskin. Mr. Baskin, and he said, I'm not Mr. Baskin, my father's Mr. Baskin. Uh, um, uh, really changed my life. Uh, I learned so much. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about how we met, et cetera, and then I was going to ask Ozzy how he met. Uh, uh, we go way back. But, yeah, um, but as it turns out, a little false advertising, this was going to be a conversation between Ozzy and myself. But I have been out of town. I just got back. And I am seeing the show for the first time, as you are, uh, right now. So instead, uh, Paul Gullah, who most of you know, runs this place. Uh, and has been here for 30 years, is going to have a bit of a conversation. Uh, if uh, there's time afterwards, I'm happy to talk to people a little bit about uh, my personal relationship with Leonard. But mostly, I think uh, you're all going to be more interested in hearing about the sculpture and things like that. So I thank you. Uh, and Jose Abaskin, Paul Gullet, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming. Um, I'm always very excited to put on a show of Baskin's work because it always gives more than it takes. Um, I find that even after 30 years of talking about Leonard constantly, and, and sometimes I feel like I, I just I talk about him in my head after the day is over, um, I still find new things about him that are really exciting. And um, you know, I've heard this place described as the house that Baskin built, and Baskin. You know, in the when Rich first met Leonard, he was a young gallerist just trying to make a name for himself and starting out. And Leonard gave him credibility at a time when, you know, he was just starting. And well, I took away his credibility. <laughs> <laughs> it was a give and take. Um, and and so it, so it really Leonard had a lot to do with how this gallery came to be what it is. Um, and he was not just a source of great art, but he was a voice of, of how to keep your proper values in mind. I mean, he was a regulator about making sure that we were honest in the way we were portraying things and that we were, we were showing things properly. And, and he would come in and chastise me regularly for hanging things next to each other that shouldn't be next to each other. And, and of course, he was always right. Um, but, but I always appreciated the fact that he was always giving and always had something to say that made us better. And so I want to thank you for coming and enjoying this, this show with us. And um, you know, we've tried to put together a nice little survey of his sculptures from some of the earliest pieces that we have through, uh, through the 90s and what characterized each decade. So, um, and that's what we've done. So, um, Posey? So, um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you all for coming. And, um, and there's more space over here for the people uh, all the way at the back if, if you want to move in. Um, and uh, thank you to Paul and to Rich for, for mounting a really handsome show. And um, I think one of the things that was really interesting, particularly given the moment that we're in, um, as the show came together, uh, was seeing some of the, the political themes that run through Leonard's work from, from the earliest days all the way through his, his career. And, um, and it, it was just interesting to see those threads as a show that was trying to be a, a representative sampling of work from over five decades uh, to see those consistent threads um, and sort of the underlying values. And Leonard always felt that um, 
that sculpture wasn't really suited for communicating political ideas, uh, that prints were a more suitable medium for that, that, um, that prints were quick, they were, um, could be widely dispersed, they were more suited to, to narrative rather than the monumentality of sculpture. Um, and you can see it in some of his prints where at times he is quite explicitly political. Um, but those same uh, political values of his, um, or at least the underlying themes that led to his political values are really visible in the sculpture. And that's been interesting to see. Uh, from, a, from a gallerist perspective, I'm always trying to be a bridge between the artist and, and the, the viewer and to say, oh, how can I make this piece more accessible? How can I give somebody a step into this work and be able to help them see what I see in it or what, what, what Leonard might want you to see in it or even what they could see in it that has nothing to do with my views or anything. Um, so part of what I look at and say, well, how can I pigeonhole this artist into this little box to make it easier to, to view, which, which automatically does a disservice to the artist, but it helps somebody step into it. In some ways, Leonard was easy and difficult to pigeonhole that way, because he always had this, these themes that would run through his work, and he never wavered from these values. I mean, you can see some of his earliest works and some of his latest works, and they all have themes, this resistance to oppression, this, this sort of defiance, this sort of standing up for the content that art needs to portray and, and, and say okay, it needs to look at the world and the values that we hold and look at the human condition and say, okay, is this where we should be? Um, and he never wavered from that. So it's easy for me to, to pigeonhole him in, in, in a way to, to sort of say, here's how you look at Leonard's work. Um, but in this show, we tried to find at least one or two themes that went through that you could see all of his work through that lens. And we found that this, this resistance to oppression was something that he, he constantly tried to get, get, get through in his works from, from the earliest to the latest. And so we sort of had that as an underlying theme through this. Um, there's a piece in the, in the early piece in the 40s, one of the first ones on the left, Pele the Conqueror, he was reading a lot of Marxist literature at the time, and he read a book called Paley the Conqueror about uh, proletarian struggle in, in, um, in Denmark. And he was very excited about these ideas, but he was an individualist. And so there was a struggle in him about, you know, you know communist ideas versus the, in, the, the individual. And he was resisting the oppression of his own ideas even back then. And so I, I like starting with that piece because I think it, it gives a real sense of his relationship to his art throughout his entire career. Um, and as you get into the 50s, um, then he starts to sort of work on some of his major series, <coughs> because The Dead Men being one of the first major series that he did, um, which I, I mean, the, the Dead Men are a perfect um, example in that, um, so Leonard served in the Navy during the Second World War and then after the war uh, studied under the GI Bill. Uh, ended up with no student loans. We should be so lucky today. Um, and he studied at the New School in New York and then spent a year in Florence and Paris studying art. And while he was in Paris, um, he I think that was his first exposure to, uh, the French term for them is gisants, um, these tomb sculptures that if you go into any of the French cathedrals or there's also many examples in the Louvre, um, these sculptures of, from the medieval and Renaissance period of um, dead people lying in repose, um, beautiful, perfect in every way, with their hands crossed on their chests. Um, but they are invariably the princes and the dukes and the archbishops and the cardinals. Um, 
and Leonard was was struck by their beauty and mastery of sculptural form, but he was also acutely aware of who wasn't represented. Um, and that was the impetus for his series of Dead Men. Um, and then uh, it started as Dead Men, it became Dead People. Um, and that, those dead figures were really the, um, the dominant subject of his work in the, the 50s. Um, and what they were was an effort to, to represent the forgotten, the unnoticed, the people who built the damn cathedrals, um, but whose, whose names are forgotten. Um, and that belief that it's not just the, the princes and the archbishops who are worthy of memorialization. And that whole series was his effort to, uh, in his way, to, to speak to and address that inequity um, and to try and do it in a, uh, in a way for the ages. Um, yeah. I think it's interesting how you know, the, the, the Dead Men series they're so incomplete. I mean, they're, they're missing legs, they're missing mm -hmm. arms, and some of them, you know, have, have no feet. And I mean, they're these sort of shreds of humans, you know. But and they're almost dreaming. They're placid. They're not lying there in agony. They're they're almost, almost as if I mean, well, you know, they're, that they're, they're dead. dead. They're dead. <laughs> they're dead. You know, they're, um, you know, they have no more no more pain. But they're but they're clearly they're clearly not whole. They're clearly not whole, which I think is is an interesting factor of that. We have a little a hanging man down by my desk as you come in. It's only about six inches long, but it has no arms, you know. Um, it, 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 its legs sort of taper down and the feet kind of disappear. And, and in some ways it makes it all the more horrible. And in some ways it, it sort of makes it this sort of ergonomic shape, you know. Uh, it's less, some, in some ways a little less human and in some ways a little more human. And, and it sort of goes right in the middle there, which I think is fascinating. You know, at least when, when I look at that work, I wonder, well, well why? Why is, this, why is this so incomplete? Um, um, and as you, as you, if you look in the front room, you know, there, are, there are other pieces, even the, the figures are almost, you know, they meld into one another and become obstinate. You know, there's a little seated fat man there who's, who's almost as wide as he is tall. He's this little block, you know, and he's got his arms crossed like, there's no way I am moving, you know. I, I, even my, even though my feet are hanging over the edge, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be here this way. I'm gonna think this way, no matter what you say. Um, which he, he is a perfect example of Leonard's commitment to monumentality and his belief that that you should never confuse scale with monumentality. That you can have a 14-foot sculpture that somehow manages not to be monumental. There you've got a little pudgy fat man who is absolutely monumental. Yeah. Um, and uh, that was, uh, I remember him speaking about that distinction and um, that um, he felt that sculpture should be monumental, that it should be um, that it should communicate um, deeper and more profound values. Um, and yeah. and I, I think he, he's, it's interesting because sort of moving on from the dead men, um, as he got into the 60s, he started to, um, to use and to represent figures from different mythologies, from classical myth, uh, from the Bible, um, from, uh, from history. Um, Puts them in context. And, um, but trying to plumb those, um, those depths of um, deeper human states, um, 
you know, that um, Andromache is really an, an exploration of grief. Um, she was the, um, the wife of <coughs> Hector, the great um, a Trojan hero uh, at the time of the Trojan War who was um, killed by Achilles. And uh, her, the, the account of her grief after Hector's death um, in, in the Iliad is profoundly moving. And this was, I think, his, um, he was exploring grief in this sculpture. Um, and um, he, it's hard to be articulate about some of these things. Um, you know, it, it's interesting to then look, uh, let's see, about a decade and a half later in his um, portraying Medea, who is uh, standing right there, um, who is a, um, a more ambiguous figure. Um, you know, there is probably nobody in, in all of classical mythology who was more wronged and who wronged more than Medea. Um, and, uh, and his, I think he does a remarkable job of capturing her, her ambiguity. It's, it's hard to, uh, to know what to feel about Medea. Um, you know, that there's a combination of um, empathy and pity and horror um, all wrapped up. Um, well, I think that's what, what he does so effectively. Now, the little piece over here, Lazarus um, and Phaedra over here, were sort of, they kind of bridge the 50s and the 60s and they, as he starts to do his wrapped figures and as you start to see these, these, these visages totally obscured with their, with their their garments, you know, the wrappings and the lines, even that the lines of their body are just so totally distorted. Um, and I imagine that a lot of the art world after World War II was sort of putting itself back together, saying, you know, how do we move forward? You know, how do we move forward after, after everything that we've seen, after everything that we've done? And I don't know what Leonard's feelings were about the post-war, um, you know, how, how he felt about what, how the world could put itself back together after all this cataclysm and all this death and all this suffering. But when you look at something like Phaedra, next to, to Rich over there, um, you know, all you see is this tiny little face and, and the, the, the wrapping's like armor, you know, and it, when, you, when Posey talks about the ambiguity of some of these characters, it's almost hard to know what they're feeling except because their armor is just so thick. All you see is this tiny little face looking out and, and, and he used that a lot, that wrapped figure throughout the entirety of his career, and you can see it even in the, the, the American pieces here, and the, the, the wrapped, the ceremonial figure, the wood piece in the corner, and it gave him a great ability to sort of use line as well, but you know, it's a great metaphor for how, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I'm going to put words in his mouth, um, <laughs> you know, to say, we can take them out again. I can take them out, that's your job. Um, you know, they said, "This is our, this is our trappings. This is, this is, this is everything that we have put around us, our humanity." And can you see what's inside? Because there's just so much of this stuff around. How do we get through it? You know, how, how do we see what's what's underneath? And I think Phaedra and and Lazarus, especially, are this gateway from from the dead men who are so clearly just human. You see, there's nothing. There's nothing between them. There's, there's not even the lines of the body between them and the world. Now we start to get into the rap figures, and of course, Andromache is is, is much more um, is dazzling because he's got all these beautiful lines and these curves, and um, and she's just totally obscured. Um, but you're you're almost having a hard time seeing her, her her grief through how dazzling these lines and these curves are. So you're sort of torn. Um, but as we go through into the into the into the 60s and, and the 70s, 
these rap figures sort of come more and more and more. Um, and of course, I don't know if you had a chance to see outside this Holocaust, this uh, Ann Arbor Holocaust Memorial, which is the, this mountain of wrappings with this figure who's sort of head in the crook of his arm with one hand going up to, to the sky. Um, that's all trappings, except for this, the top of the head and this one arm that's just saying, you know, uh, reaching for some kind of, you know, some kind of hope, you know, some kind of, you know, reaching up to heaven or the sky or whatever it is that he's reaching for. Um, or she. Or she's it's, reaching for. Thank you. It's, it's um, ambiguous. It's very it's ambiguous. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I, I think that's, it was such an effective metaphor for what he was, yes. for, for, for how he was saying, how do, we, how do we get through? How do we find out what the human condition is? And yet at some time, at times he would, um, like with the, the glutted death, the winged figure there in front of the window, um, he would also portray the figure with nothing to hide. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And um, you know his his capacity to to sculpt and to represent a human body without trappings um, was was remarkable. Um, I, I also love that figure because um, with that one um, and the little seated uh, glutted death um, over on the other side. Um, Leonard is not just relying on the um, the historical mythological forms, but creating his um, his own symbolism, his own imagery. Um, the idea behind those, and it's sort of typically. Uh, light in that Leonard way. Um, he felt that you know, the angel of death was usually portrayed as this gaunt, skeletal figure, uh, going all the way back to the medieval period. Um, but he felt that in our time, in the 20th and unfortunately now in the 20th century, the angel of death is not an emaciated and starved figure. The angel of death has had too much to consume. And so he represented death not as emaciated, but as glutted, as overfilled, as seated to the point of not being able to consume anymore, uh, to the point of exhaustion. Um, and uh, it's, I think, a particularly powerful um, piece of representation that, um, that those two are sort of companion pieces in a way, the, um, the standing bloody death and the, uh, the seated, exhausted one. Um, I think it's interesting how when we go from, say, Phaedra and Andromache, these people who are victims of grief, who have just been, <coughs> had life happen to them, as he goes to, to say Medea, all of a sudden this defiance comes out. You know, it was Vashti in the corner there, who, with her little defiant turn there. Uh, you know, now death is death is something that can be seen. Death is something that, you know, it, it's a character now that that you can see and you can resist against. You know, um, whereas you're not just you're not portraying the effects of death now. Death is something that that we can look at and stand eye to eye with, and you, people like you know Medea and Vashti and a lot of the characters that you see coming out in his work, his idea of death shifts and his resistance to oppression shifts to go from a description of of what's happened to now we're now we're now we're players in it now now we're fighting back you know in whatever you're fighting back against whatever whatever movement or whatever ideas that that you're resisting. Um, you know, as he got into the 80s and 90s, there was this act of resistance to say, okay, we're going to name, you know, what, what we're, we're resisting against. You know? And, um, and you know, Medea, I always, I, I think it was Lisa who told me years ago that Medea should be high enough that she'd be looking right at her belly 
which would be the height that her children would be viewing her. And when I raise it that high, you can really see in the face the, um, you know, the, the tension. Um, and, and you almost feel like one of her children sort of looking up and they've got that little weapon in the back there. Um, and, um, and you become a part of, you become a part of that experience. Um, uh, not, just, not just really a viewer of it, um, which is I think an interesting shift in, in his work. Um, Speaking of being a part of the experience, should we take some questions? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I've been practicing. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we can keep blathering indefinitely, um, but we can talk about Leonard without firing a synapse. Um, so, but um, but I, if there are questions, we would love to um, take them. If not, um, we can keep going. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I I I tell I tell the staff and staff here have have um, can attest to this that for the last 20 years or so, Leonard has been a part of how I hang this gallery. And I'll, and I'll say something like, oh, I can't do that. Leonard would haunt me. <laughs> Leonard would come back, you know. And it just shows sort of his presence here. As I was hanging the show, I heard his voice in my head, um, constantly saying, you know. No, not there. No, not there. <laughs> um, do you know how long I worked on the back of that piece and you can't see it, now move it. Um, and, um, and so it, in some ways, I, 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 I hope that he would be happy with this show. I know that there would be things about this show that he would say, mm, you, could have, you could have done this, you could have done that. But, um, but I'm also interested to get people's opinions about the show. You know, what, what, were there things, yes? Well, I just had a question because you had to choose. Mm -hmm. And was there anything that you left out that you would particularly have loved to have had that you, for space reasons or... Oh, the reasons? sins of omission are awful. Yeah. Um, yes, there, there's always, I mean, it, there are confines of the space. You know, there are things that um, I, I wasn't sure that I would be able to fit what I wanted in this. And we had to leave pieces yeah. outside. There's the piece on the landing which originally was going to be in here, the sculptor. Um, and, and the, the seated figure, the seated halfway figure up the stairs. Up the stairs. Um, and that, that ended up, I, it would have just dominated the room. It would have been too much, so we had to leave that, leave that out, out there. And there's pieces that are all around the gallery that I thought that maybe could be a, a part of the show. And stand as sort of important milestones in, in his career. You know, his, there are things we can talk about, like his raptors and his bird imagery, which is a huge part of what he does. And you can see it even in the, even in the garments, there's this feather-like feather -like, uh, designs um, that we had to, we couldn't go into it. And I, I talk about being, you know, pigeonholing Leonard, but he resists that so much that, you know, uh, if I want to stay to one subject, he doesn't let me. Because he says, well, you can't talk about that without talking about this. And, and how can you leave out this piece? Um, so, so the sins of omission are awful, and um, and so I, 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 we just at some point we just have to say this is what's going to be. This is what show. You did a really um, more than adequate and actually pretty impressive job of, of dealing with the sculpture. I realize that that's the focus of this, but the, you know we see a variety of prints hanging here and there, and I was more familiar as a young art student with Leonard Baskin's prints. Yeah. And I, I'm really interested in a, a little bit of um, history on, you mentioned polit that was his kind of political outlet. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of political. <laughs> 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 just a little. <laughs> just a little. Right. Yeah. Um, and I'd like you to ex expand on that just a little bit, because I found that lacking for me, because I perked up and then it was gone. Yes. yes. Um, so, Um, I mean, he felt that um, he liked prints because they were a popular medium. That uh, when he started out as a young printmaker, um, he was making woodcuts primarily. And 
he um, he wouldn't addition the woodcuts. He would just print them and print them and print them and print them. Um, and um, it, he really disliked the idea that you would make a block that you could print a thousand impressions from and you would print 50 and number them one to 50 and say that's the addition. Um, and that sort of limitation that he felt was artificial uh, that was purely for commercial purposes ultimately. Um, of course, as time went on and he had to put food on the table, uh, he numbered in limited editions. But, um, you know, he was also never averse to running off a few more. Um, and he liked the, the way that prints could reach a wide and deep audience. Um, the, you know, you could really scatter them to the four winds and they would be all everywhere. Um, and you see many of the same themes, um, and not even just the same themes, but um, he would often explore this explicitly the same imagery. Um, I mean, you can see it uh, with the etching of the exhausted, blooded death um, that's just to the right of the sculpture. Um, you know, he's representing the same notion, the same image uh, in two drastically different media, in sculpture in the round and in a, an etched plate. Um, so there, things do cross over. You see things recurring. The um, right outside the door to the show, just to the right, there's a a sibyl. Um, he starting in the seventies or the eighties, seventies, I think. He got very interested in the sibyls, who were these um, women prophets from the ancient world, um, and. He did a number of sculptures. He also did a, a book with a uh, poet named Ruth Fainlight. Um, and there's a woodcut hanging next to the sculpture outside. Um, and they're both of this uh, Sibylline figure with a, an owl. Um, and to see how he represents the same subjects across media. Uh, is really interesting. But then there are also things that he would do in prints that he would not do in sculpture. That, um, and I think it's probably more visible in his earlier work when, um, when the prints were more sort of didactically political. Um, that, um, that that divide is greater. And I think there was, to some degree, um, over time, over the decades, a, a coming together of what started as more, more disparate streams. Um, he, he worked an idea in lots of different media before he would come up. So it, when um, that very large piece, the um, Angels to the Jew, the, the and other angel, the large angel, when he first come in, it was a series of, what is it, 50? 30, 30, 35 or 50 watercolors, huge watercolors. And there's a series of etchings. And he would just sort of go through and do some drawings and do some etchings. And oftentimes it would culminate in a sculpture, but not always in that direction. He would circle around an idea a lot of times to see how am I going to work through this, you know. Uh, and, and, and sometimes you see the same images recurring decades yeah. apart. Yeah. Um, you know, you can see a thread from the, in the, the little room outside the 50s, 1950s room, there's a bar relief of a crow. Um, and it's not hanging, but there's a, an etching from the early 90s that One it, of my sins. it's that crow, uh, sins of omission. Um, the through lines sometimes carry over decades. Yeah. Yeah. When I first conceived of the show, I had probably four times as many prints I wanted to put up. And then, um, and then when it came down to, you know, it, was, it was overwhelming. Yeah, you know, so we, um, we, we, we pared it down just to sort of give people an example. But, um, yeah. <coughs> yeah.
How long would it take him to complete a work like this? His answer to that question was 40 years. <laughs> um, it varied from piece to piece. Um, that piece is, is a little unusual in that um, it's a bronze that was actually cast from a wood carving. Um, so chisel marks. Yes. Um, that most of the bronzes were worked in clay and then plaster, um, which is a quicker process. Uh, carving is slow. Um, one of the things he liked about not just working in clay, but working, he would work initially in clay and then do a plaster cast, um, but then work it further in plaster. And he liked the plaster because um, he could take wet plaster and add things and uh, in an almost clay-like fashion. Um, but once the plaster was hard, he could go at it with a chisel and carve it um, in a way that was more like the way he would work wood or stone. Um, and you can see that in, um, particularly in some of the later sculptures, but like in the, the seated death or um, in the wings of uh, the standing death, uh, you can see that he was uh, carving the plaster. Um, carving is a slow process. I mean, there, he also wouldn't work on a single piece at once. He would have multiple pieces going at once, but um, a piece might sit in the studio of a wood carving for a number of months, um, sometimes a number of years. Uh, sometimes he would work on something and then sort of put it aside. Um, but sculpting is a, it's a fairly slow and laborious process. It's, um, you know, with the graphic work, he, he worked in watercolor and gouache, and, um, you know, you can't be slow with those media. Um, but sculpture you can keep, keep tinkering with over time, so uh, different time frames. Did he ever say, Hosey, come on over here and finish this off for me? Yeah. <laughs> He might have gotten some help starting something off, but never finishing it never off. Finish. Um, you know, uh, slap some more plaster on here, yes, but um, work with the chisel, no, that was his. That was his. Yes. Well, great. Thank, Thank you all, all for coming. coming. If you, if you get a chance, um, the show is a much different experience when the room is empty. Um, the show will be up through the end of October. Please come back and spend some time with it. Uh, Leonard's very re rewarding. <laughs> <laughs>